Welcome to the second video for chapter 13, where we will be discussing lactation and feeding the infant. We begin by defining lactation, which is the process of milk secretion from the mammary glands of the breast. This, of course, allows for breastfeeding infants. Most women can breastfeed, but it is a skill that requires preparation before birth. Women who are interested in breastfeeding are encouraged to read books and find information from professional organizations to guide them. They can also consult a certified lactation consultant who are considered the experts on breastfeeding and newborn care. The main point here is that a woman does not just have a baby and know how to breastfeed automatically. It is not an effort. It is more so a skill that needs to be executed. But most women can breastfeed with the proper information. Now the amount of breast milk that produced is going to vary from woman to woman, but it is often about 25 ounces per day. Insufficient milk production is rare. And since an infant is attached to the breast, in many, in most instances, it's going to be difficult to see how much is consumed. But warning sign that a baby is not getting enough or that there is insufficient milk production is if they are having dry diapers. So there should be about six to eight wet diapers per day. If there are fewer than this and the diapers remain dry, this is a warning sign that something's going wrong. Lactation itself does have nutritional demands. If you can remember from part one of this lecture, when we looked at the image that compared nutritional demands for non-pregnant women and women during pregnancy, there was a third bar that had demands during lactation. The energy cost of lactation is approximately 500 calories. So a woman is burning an additional 500 calories per day to produce milk for breastfeeding. A common recommendation is to match that energy cost with an additional 330 calories consumed. In theory, the rest of that calorie need, 170 calories, will be drawn from fat stores that were gained during the pregnancy. So breastfeeding in this sense can be used as a strategy to help a woman return to her pre-pregnancy weight. Another thing that is increased is fluid needs. This is because breast milk is made from water from the mother a common recommendation for breastfeeding mothers is to drink 13 cups of water per day. In terms of variations in breast milk, there is not large variations in the quality or nutritional composition. Diet will usually affect the quantity. So nutritional composition is quite consistent even in times of nutritional deprivation, but quantity can be affected. As was mentioned in the previous lecture with things like iron and calcium, the body will deliver nutrients at the expense of maternal stores. So it will take away from the mother in order to ensure that adequate nutrients are available for the infant. Most women can best breastfeed, but there are certain contraindications to breastfeeding. Contraindication would be an instance where breastfeeding is not advised. With recent alcohol or caffeine intake, breast milk should not be given to the infant through the breast. Alcohol concentrations peak within one hour after a drink, so a woman is 
expected to wait a prolonged period until all the alcohol is cleared from the system before they can resume feeding the infant directly from the breast. Excess caffeine can make the infant jittery and wakeful. So for the same reason, breastfeeding after excessive caffeine intake is not recommended. Tobacco use is a contraindication to breastfeeding. This is because chemicals and cigarettes are transferred to the infant and of course will have negative consequences. So will illicit drugs. As a whole, illicit drug users should not be breastfeeding. Certain medications can cause issues with breastfeeding. So a medication list should always be evaluated by a physician to avoid any complications with breastfeeding. HIV can be passed along to an infant in the form of breast milk. In developed nations where there's access to formula and clean drinking water, women with HIV are not advised to engage in breastfeeding. However, the World Health Organization still recommends breastfeeding with HIV if it is the safest route. This is mostly going to be in undeveloped nations or developing nations in which they may not have access to things like formula or clean water. Common cold is one that is often a question, but yes, you can breastfeed with a common cold normally. Feeding the infant in the first year of life, of course, is crucial. Is in this period that growth rate is the fastest. At this time, the basal metabolic rate is about two times that of an adult. So energy demands are much higher per pound. For example, for an adult, we're looking at about 30 calories per pound required to maintain weight. To foster healthful growth in an infant, we're looking at about 100 calories per pound. It's over three times the amount per pound. You can see how significant the growth is in the first year of life, right? This is the difference here. We can look at these orange bars, and as the years go on, they get smaller and smaller. So the baby and becoming a child is still growing during this time, but the most significant amount of growth occurs in that first year of life. Here we have an image that is showing all of the increased nutrient demands. So beyond energy, we're also seeing an increased need for protein in an infant compared to an adult, uh, the micronutrients as well. You can see the needs of an infant for iodine, vitamin D are significant. The American Academy of Pediatrics, which is the medical organization that produces many of the guidelines that pregnant women across the nation are recommended to follow, recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life, and then breastfeeding and complementary foods for up to one year. This is because breast milk provides the ideal energy nutrient balance for infants. The high fat content of breast, fil breast milk helps to meet the increased energy demands of the infant. Breast milk has ample amounts of all nutrients that the infant needs, with the exception of vitamin D. I'm going to put a star next to this one because it is a very common exam question. Because breast milk does not contain the recommended amount of vitamin D, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend supplemental vitamin D 
for exclusively breastfed infants. Now the Academy of Pediatrics recommends breastfeeding because it does have some unique benefits. Breast milk contains immune factors from the mother, and so it provides protection against certain viral and bacterial infections that cannot be achieved with the formula feeding. Other potential short and long-term benefits of breastfeeding include fewer allergic reactions for the child as it begins eating various foods, lower rates of overweight and obesity throughout the lifespan, the cost effectiveness of breastfeeding, and then also the environmental impact, which is low impact. Nevertheless, we must recognize formula feeding as it is an acceptable alternative to breastfeeding. And even though I can sit here and talk about breastfeeding and the unique benefits and how it's recommended, it's one thing to recognize the um, virtue of it in a class lecture. Uh, it is much more difficult to actually put it into practice and successfully breastfeed. So from what I've gathered from friends who have gone through this uh, before, uh, can be a tremendous stress with the pressure to go through uh, breast with breastfeeding, and women with new babies can uh, receive criticism from other mothers, friends, and families if they choose to go the formula route. And this is unacceptable. Uh, formula feeding is an acceptable alternative. It can satisfy all the energy and nutrient requirements for the baby. Some advantages is that it allows various individuals to feed and bond with the infant, which may be less achievable through breastfeeding. It also creates a greater allowance of the parents to see how much of the formula is being consumed and gives an easier route to quantifying uh, total energy and the consumption of all nutrients across the boards. Uh, one thing that is not listed here, but I will mention, is that most formulas are going to be vitamin D fortified, and so the infant will not need that additional suppl supplementation that they need with breastfeeding. Some possible disadvantages of formula feeding, of course, it does not uh, provide those immune factors that were discussed as a unique benefit of breastfeeding. It is more costly, of course, than breastfeeding, and then it is also going to have a greater environmental impact, which is not a great thing. The formula that is given is designed to mimic the nutritional composition of breast milk. Cow's milk is not an appropriate formula to use in the first year of life. This is because it is too high in protein and too low in fat. It is also too low in the essential nutrients in iron and calcium. You can see how this shakes out. Breast milk is about 39% carbohydrate, 55% fat, and 6% protein. Formula does its best to mimic this amount, but with cow's milk, we have uh, a protein content that exceeds the appropriate amount for an infant, and the fat content is below uh, what we would like to see. In terms of introducing the first solid foods, infants are generally ready for solid foods after four to six months. Iron fortified cereal has long been a recommended first food, but it does not have to be. Some considerations when introducing foods includes targeting specific nutrient needs. So the need for iron, zinc, and vitamin C begins to exceed what is provided by breast milk around this time. So it is a good idea to give foods that contain these nutrients in order to satisfy those needs. Mothers will also 
want to detect and control allergic reactions at this stage. This can be accomplished by introducing single ingredient foods and doing it one at a time. What you don't want to do is introduce multiple foods at once with multiple ingredients because if the infant has an adverse reaction, it is difficult to know what exactly caused that reaction. And then at some point, you're probably going to have to reintroduce those foods to figure out what exactly it is. Here we have various developmental stages. As we can see, at four to six months, the baby is going to be able to sit erect with support, and they can do the chewing action, enhanced mouth. So this is usually about time when they start eating some simple foods like iron fortified cereal or pureed meats, beans, vegetables, and fruits. Then as they start progressing towards one year, their development is going to get a little bit more advanced. So by the time they're eight to 10 months old, they can begin to hold their own bottle, uh, reach for and grab the uh, food and spoon. They can sit unsupported. And then with this, they're going to have increased availability to foods. So as they get closer to one year, they can increase their variety start eating finely cut meats, fish, casseroles, uh, and be feeding themselves. By one year, an infant's diet should include foods from all food groups, so focusing on variety, balance, and moderation, those principles that us as adults should be following ourselves. There are certain foods that should be avoided though, things like baby desserts, which are a significant source of empty calories, sugar alcohols, which can cause gastrointestinal distress, honey, which can be a source of contamination, contamination excuse me, that a young uh, system cannot handle, unpasteurized milk or juice, same reason as the honey, right? Contamination that they cannot handle as well as an adult, as well as raw and undercooked eggs, meat, poultry, or fish for the same reason as those listed above. Last thing is the meal times with infants. It is important during meal times to foster a sense of autonomy so to give them a little bit of control over the wheel, uh, but also sticking to some basic guidelines. Some basic guidelines to keep in mind are to discourage unacceptable behavior, such as throwing food, avoiding distractions during mealtimes, such as eating in front of the television. You want the infant to focus on the task in front of them. You'll want to let them explore and enjoy their food, such as eating with fingers, dipping in sauces, mashing around their food and mixing foods. So there needs to be a line drawn between what is unacceptable, like throwing, and what is encouraged, like experimenting with different tastes and textures and flavors. Lastly, don't force food on them, such as a sound telling an infant, um, you can't do X until you eat Y and Z. Creating hard rules like this can lead to an unhealthy relationship with food and have lasting consequences. And that is it for part two of chapter 13. Thank you guys for watching. If you've made it this far, it means you've finished the final video of the semester. Next up is going to be the final exam, exam number three out of three.